As we journeyed through time, we started to use science to help us discover more and create new materials. As the understanding of chemistry and physics evolved, humans have harnessed these discoveries to create a diverse array of materials tailored to meet the specific needs and applications. Through a deep understanding of molecular structures and interactions, scientists and engineers have revolutionized industries and transformed our everyday lives. From the development of synthetic polymers and plastics that exhibit desired properties like flexibility, durability, and heat resistance, to the design of alloys with enhanced strength and corrosion resistance, chemistry has played a pivotal role. Take the modern ballistics military helmet, for example. Compared to the Greek helmet, modern advances have made it lighter and stronger using a material called Kevlar. To review, chemical bonding is a fundamental process through which atoms combine to form molecules and compounds. There are three primary models that describe chemical bonding, the ionic model, the covalent model, and the metallic model. The ionic model involves the transfer of electrons between atoms, resulting in the formation of positively and negatively charged ions that are held together by electrostatic forces. In the covalent model, atoms share electrons to achieve a stable electron configuration, forming covalent bonds characterized by the overlapping of electron orbitals. This model is prevalent in organic and inorganic compounds. The metallic model, on the other hand, describes the bonding in metals, where a sea of delocalized electron exists between a lattice of positively charged metal ions, creating a strong metallic bond. While these three models provide a framework for understanding diverse types of chemical bonding, there can be an oversimplification when describing chemical bonds. Therefore, it is best to think of chemical bonding as a continuum where different bonding types are present in different molecules to a certain degree. Almost all molecules in nature don't exactly fit within one of those models exclusively. A great way to represent bonds is a bonding triangle. Bonding triangle model helps us categorize different bonds visually as well as help us predict properties that those bonds may possess. While there may be some exceptions, the bonding triangle can provide a predictable insight to properties and behaviors. How does the bonding triangle work? The triangle illustrates that these bonding types can be seen as extremes of a continuum with pure metallic bonding at one corner, pure ionic bonding at another corner, and pure covalent bonding at the remaining corner. In reality, most materials exhibit a combination of these bonding types with a varying degree of electron sharing and transferring. By considering the position of a material within the triangle, scientists can gain insights into its physical properties, such as electrical conductivity, melting point, and hardness. The position of a compound in the bonding triangle can be determined by electronegativity data. Electronegativity is a measure of the tendency of an atom to gain electrons. Electronegativity values can be looked up and are different for every element, as seen here on this periodic table. If we take a look at calcium, we can see that electronegativity value is 1.0, while oxygen has a value of 3.5. What this means is that oxygen has a much higher tendency to gain electrons than calcium. The higher the value, the greater the pull the element has on electrons. The bonding triangle is made from calculations of electronegativity difference and the average electronegativity of the bonded atoms. This creates a graph where a triangle of results form. Let's take a look at an example on the next slide. Looking back at our calcium oxide compound, we again see where calcium oxide is on the bonding triangle. Since it has a high electronegativity difference and a relatively low electronegativity average, it falls under ionic as the bond type. Let's take a couple other examples to show the range in our triangle. If we were to take methane, CH4, we can look at our values when bonding carbon and hydrogen. Carbon has an electronegativity of 2.5 and hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1 we get an electronegativity difference of 0.4 and an average of 2.3. Let's see where that will fall on our bonding triangle. We see that CH4 falls far in the covalent range of bonding. Last example is manganese 2 chloride, MnCl2. We get an electronegativity difference of 1.5 and an electronegativity average of 2.25. Let's see where that falls on our bonding triangle. This compound is a bit different. It falls into a range that is covalent, but almost ionic. It has a strong electronegativity difference, but not strong enough to be considered ionic. No matter what compound we calculate, they will all fall somewhere on our bonding triangle. Now give it a try. Where would the compound lithium chloride fall on our graph? What kind of bond would LiCl make? Pause the video to calculate and hit play when you have the answer. If you said ionic, you are correct. We see the electronegativity difference of 2.0 and an average of 2.0 fall in ionic range. Great job. Now, how does this bonding triangle help us as scientists? As said previously, 
Properties of different compounds can be predicted based on the position they fall within the bonding triangle. Any tool that we can create in science that can predict outcomes is very important and very useful. Having the power to create materials that we can predict the properties of is what makes science so powerful, which is where this bonding triangle comes into play. If we were to take four compounds and place them on the binding triangle, we would be able to generally predict boiling point and melting point in these compounds. Looking at the positioning of MgO, Al2O3, SiO2, and P2O5, we can see they all fall in the range of percent ionic and percent covalent. This is referring to the electronegativity difference of the elements in the compound. As the electronegativity difference increases, the type of bond moves into a higher ionic percentage. Each compound falls in this continuum of percent ionic and percent covalent character. As the compound holds more ionic character, we see a higher melting point and boiling point. As we fall towards covalent character, we see the trend fall the other way and the compounds have a lower melting point and boiling point. Other properties such as conductivity can also be predicted based on how ionic or covalent the bond is. Similarly, we could predict different metallic physical traits by doing a very similar comparison to percent metallic, which can change traits like electrical conductivity, malleability, and ductility of metals. Not all metals are the same and can have different traits that can be useful in different scenarios. For example, gold is an excellent conductor and is plated onto plugs for a lot of high-end audio equipment, which helps create an excellent signal transfer. But gold is very malleable and soft metal. Gold would be a bad support structure because it easily bends and can break. First, it is important to understand and review an important point. We have thus far been talking about materials that are chemically bonded to each other. When we look at the compound magnesium oxide, we need to understand that magnesium and oxygen are chemically bonded and have become a new substance. Both the magnesium and oxygen properties have been changed into new properties that MgO possesses. And the properties are very different from elemental magnesium and oxygen. But we can also change properties on a molecular level without having to chemically bond elements or compounds together. By creating a mixture, properties of materials can be enhanced to suit a specific need. We call these composite materials. Because it's not a new bond, these mixtures of materials still hold their original properties and can help create these enhanced substances. Materials such as fiberglass and concrete are good examples of enhanced composite material. Alloys are another example of an enhanced composite material. Alloys are metallic substances created by combining two or more different elements, usually metals, to enhance their properties and create new materials with unique characteristics. These additive elements create different lattice structures that can change the property of the original pure metal. Alloys possess a wide range of desirable properties, such as increased strength, hardness, corrosion resistance, and conductivity, which often surpass those of the individual component metals. These materials find extensive applications in various industries, including aerospace, automotive, construction, and electronics, where specific performance requirements need to be met. Examples of common alloys include stainless steel, a combination of iron, chromium, and nickel, bronze, which is just copper and tin, and brass, which is a combination of copper and zinc. The process of creating an alloy involves melting and mixing the constituent elements in precise proportions, resulting in a solid solution where the atoms of the different elements are evenly distributed throughout the material. Alloys consist of different metal ions and a sea of delocalized electrons. The smaller cations in red are able to fit in the spaces between the larger cations in tan in the lattice structure. When you're able to change the lattice structure, or how the elements are positioned, we are able to create structures that strengthen the metal. Steel, for example, is an alloy of iron at its base and carbon and manganese as the additive elements. Similar as above, the structure is mixed with these additive metals and creates a substance that is much more resistant to bending or breaking. Since alloys are just mixtures and not chemically bonded together, alloys like steel or brass technically don't have a specific chemical formula. Alloys are just a base metal with percent mixtures of additive metals, as you can see here. If you take a look at bronze and white gold alloys, we can see the respective mixture percent of each metal. Bronze has between 78 and 95% copper and 5 to 22% tin, along with some other trace elements. While white gold is around 75% gold, 10% palladium, 10% nickel, and 5% zinc. Since each alloy is just a mixture of each metal, they retain all the properties of the pure metal but is said are enhanced by each other in the mixture. 
Moving away from alloys and back to chemical compounds, we have so far learned about atoms and their ability to bond with each other to make many different chemical compounds of our world. As we get into more complicated bonding, we have to get it big, like really big. We have a special name for these big compounds called polymers. Polymers are large molecules that are made up of repeating structures called monomers. Because they repeat, some polymers can be absolutely huge. The largest synthetic polymer is properly called Titan and is made up of 27,000 repeating monomers. Before we discuss the details, let's make an observation. Take a look at these different monomer molecules in the picture. What do you notice is similar about all of these monomers? Hint, look at what makes them up. These monomers are called amino acids. You may have heard the term before. If not, these monomers make up many natural polymers of the body called proteins. And I know you've heard of the word protein before. The answer is all of these amino acids contain similar elements. Hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon are what make up most of the human body. There's actually a specific chemistry for these elements called organic chemistry. It's called organic chemistry because it's the chemistry of living things and all living organisms are based around carbon. We call human-made polymers synthetic polymers. Synthetic polymers are a fascinating and versatile group of materials that play a crucial role in our daily lives. One of the most well-known synthetic polymers is polyethylene, used to make a variety of products like plastic bags and bottles. Another important synthetic polymer is polyvinyl chloride, PVC, which we find in applications in pipes, electrical insulation, and vinyl records. These man-made materials possess unique properties, such as flexibility, durability, and resistance to chemicals, making them suitable for a wide range of applications. However, their widespread usage has raised environmental concerns due to the non-biodegradable nature. As a result, scientists continue to research and develop more eco-friendly alternatives while acknowledging the significant impact synthetic polymers have made on modern society. Monomers can be chained together in multiple ways based on their structure. One way they can connect, if they possess double bonds, is through additional polymerization. This describes the process by which a monomer with a carbon-to-carbon -carbon double bond, like ethene, can polymerize to form polyethene. Ethene, which has a chemical formula of CH2CH2, CH2, has a carbon-to-carbon -carbon double bond. The double bond is broken, which leaves one available bonding position on each carbon as shown here. Since both carbons are now available to bond, they can bond with other monomers on either side to create potentially very long changed polymers. This process of additional polymerization, which creates long polymers from monomers with carbon to carbon double bonds, is not exclusive to ethene or polyethene. Other molecules like chloroethene and propene can undergo the same process to create large chain polymers like polyvinyl chloride and polypropene. Additional polymerization is a very important process in the production of plastics. It is also used to produce other materials such as rubber and other fibers. Thank you.